Hello and welcome to the official podcast of Palate Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson, a podcast for those seeking the ultimate in wine, food, and travel. Each week, she interviews winemakers, chefs, celebrities, and a variety of guests that shape the way we enjoy life. I poured for you the 2014 yeah. TBH Vineyard uh, Pinot Noir. So this is the inaugural release of the TBH bottling. Um, we did a we harvested in 12 and 13 grapes from this vineyard, but we declassified the wine into a Sonoma Coast bottling. Mm -hmm. um, so 14 is the first year we put the TBH name on the bottle. It's also the first year we were able to dry farm the vines, which is a huge benchmark to me in using uh, whole cluster in the fermentation. So we're at about 60% whole cluster. Mm. I think the wine shows the tannin and the the development of what whole cluster can bring yeah, without the, the saying- Yeah, the grippy part of it the, is what you're describing, yeah. correct? without it, saying oh wow there's the white pepper and the spice yeah. and the the kind of sappy no, it, characters it definitely that just kind cluster. of envelopes your palate and yeah. it definitely holds it tight you know it's, it's a good hug it's a good tongue yes. hug and once again the acidity from this vineyard is so predominant this is still a very youthful wine yes it's it is. still very very youthful and i see this wine in my kitchen three days after I've opened it on a Friday afternoon for tasting with folks and on Sunday, I'll still be enjoying the same bottle and that's when it's singing. So uh -huh. it was enjoyable on Friday, don't get me wrong. Don't be afraid to open the bottle and enjoy it. But I know that it has a long story to tell. Uh -huh. And um, there's such it's, beautiful notes. And I mean, I don't want to wax poetical, but there's this um, kind of field strawberry Mm. This kind of yes. fertilizing quality. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, that just, it's so attractive. I just keep smelling it. Um, and high toned again. The red mm. fruit, 14 was a very red fruit driven vintage, uh, very bright and yeah. kind of high toned. Lots of spiciness, like oh, yes. hints of um, black tea and sort of spicy notes uh, in, the, in the wine. But yeah. um, no, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's, it's so sophisticated. Uh, there's so many different um, things going on in it that you could probably have an hour conversation just describing um, different flavors that, and some of them show up and then they sort of go in the foreground yeah. and then the background becomes, you know, the front and center and it just, it's constantly evolving even between sips and that's what's so incredibly poignant to me about yeah. your wines is that clearly you craft him to become something that's very cerebral as well as pleasurable because mm. this is such an exercise and really discerning for yourself how it lands on you i mean it's a conversation that can only be facilitated by something significant well why thank you <laughs> thank you very much you're very eloquent with your, <laughs> <laughs> your descriptions. Thank I, uh, you. Yeah. Mm. So, wow. as I described the 15 vintage earlier, we had a 60% reduction in yield for Pinot Noir from the 14 vintage to the 15 vintage. Yeah. So. Um, but with having less rain and um, kind of less nutrients available in the soils and so forth, the vines were in balance with a lighter crop. So what we ended up with was very intense fruit. We had incredibly small berries. The wines are very intense. They're still bright. The acidity is the same, but the fruit's a little darker there's a little more spiciness to the wines and really intense. So I love that word intense. I'm already preparing mentally and palatally to experience something that is going to kind of keep me on my toes. <laughs> and I think this wine is definitely one that keeps you on your toes. It, it uh, it's oh not quite as high toned as the, um, 
you know, it's not resonating of the level of vibrancy that the 14 kind of does. 15s are a little just more um, uh, intensity is what comes to mind. Yeah, when no, I, when I, I enjoy the, the vintage, it's, um, it's a great vintage. It's, it's just uh, wow. the one that kind of needs air, it needs patience. Um, no, for sure. It's it's got this really interesting nose. There's so many savory things going mm -hmm. on, um, baking spice, amongst others. But um, there's definitely fruit, but kind of more mature fruit in this wine. Yeah, and and what's interesting is the the maturity level at harvest. Mm -hmm. If you look at the like scientific numbers, the bricks and the pH and yeah. et cetera, et cetera, identical. Wow. The alcohol level identical um, between the 14 and the 15. So you're, you're dealing with the weather and how the vines and the fruit responded to the to the weather and the fruit set and the drought and all of those things yeah. is really what is is um, developing that in the wine. So and the texture to me is probably um, the standout. In the 2014, again, the, a lot of supple qualities. Mm. This guy is still kind of shedding that baby fat. So. Right. <laughs> it's 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 a little you know it, it's still fighting it you know yeah it, it's it's still resolving it's, yeah. itself in yeah, yeah. in bottle and yeah. as as we're kind of transitioning towards the 16 i see the 16 is almost more ready to enjoy Isn't it was amazing? such a it was such a great vintage in the the wines are more supple and there's more kind of velvety texture to yeah. the 16 wines. Um, they, they need time. Like the complexity isn't showing itself to me yet. It's, yeah. it's like all wound up in that tight little rosebud still. But yeah. when you have the palate experience, the 16 vintage is much more velvety and, and textural, um, and, and, you see the intensity to the wines, but it's not showing the complexity. It's the the bud has not opened yet on the this on the This is so much so. promise. It's like, <laughs> I don't know what to compare it to. Maybe if you see a woman that's very young, maybe like 14, 15, mm. and you can tell she's going to be stunning, and you feel kind of embarrassed that you're staring because she's so young. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> But but you know, but where you know she's this is headed. like yeah, yeah that yeah. she's gonna be like incredible yeah. beauty and, and it's obvious but it's just it's coming into its own. Right. Yeah, fifteen was an interesting vintage, um, phenomenal vintage. And this is one of those wines that well, along with the fourteen that other people that have tasted them have have given us great reviews for them. Yeah. Um, we've got 96 points on, on both of these wines, uh, um, which was kind of fun because I, I don't generally make wine. For, I, I don't make wine for review. I'm, no, I don't. I I'm don't. not. Uh, that's not my purpose no, of um, I don't see that. to. Uh, you know, it's so interesting that they got a dental, of course, which, you know, of course, a whole other conversation, but just in terms of the system, but um, the tannin structure mm -hmm. on this wine, which typically what critics sometimes, you know, um, have difficulties with, meaning that sometimes they punish the wines that are very assertive tannins. Um, to me, the 15 definitely has the, the quality of tannins, you know, again. Right. Um, it's something that you are you're grateful for it because that's that foundational block that one of the building blocks that it, very important for the wine to become yeah. this extraordinary creature no. um 14 tannins were you know more round to me so i'm glad that you know when you were reviewed and people were actually giving identical scores it's like I, i'm glad that they acknowledged what the purposefulness of those tannins was right right uh, i think that's a testimony that it's a smart decision because this wines are extraordinarily different 
but so valuable, you know, for their own reasons. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how different the flavor profile is and the fruit, yet the approach on the palate, the acidity, the, there are aspects of the wine that you can tell it's from the TBH vineyard. And, yes. And the tannin, the, the, and then a year in bottle, an extra also, year in bottle, yes. how yes. that can resolve tannins, how the tannin chains can continue to link and bond to soften and yeah. become more elegant. Because the 14 last year was in a similar really? state where oh. it was not as relaxed and understandable last year as it is this year. So, so it's not so much the vintage, it really is the quality of time in the cellar. I think yeah. it's both. Okay. I think okay. it's both. Because 15, because of the drought, the berries were smaller. Okay. Um, we used less whole cluster in 15 because we had so few berries on the stems yeah. that we felt the stems were going to impart more character. So we used less stem inclusion, but the impact is probably similar. Interesting. Yeah, I can definitely, so, if I was asked, I would, you know, say probably more stem inclusion than 15, which obviously isn't correct, but because of how the wine is landing on me. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you have a cluster of grapes and half of the berries are missing, mm -hmm. and you do 50% stem inclusion from two different vintages where yeah. All of the berries are here and half of the berries are of here course, that makes then sense. it's twice the amount of stem inclusion in my opinion so oh. it's stem inclusion isn't just we dumped all of the grapes in or it's you know you're going to have more stem inclusion character if you have fewer berries on each stem so we take that into account we're thinking about that analytically before we're going into fermentation and um, you know, what do I want somebody to say nice use of stems in my <laughs> fermentation? Or do I want somebody to say, this is a nice wine. Did you use stem inclusion? What, you know, how much new, oak? like, I'm kind of confused. Like I, I get that you probably did, but I don't know how much because it's so artful that it's that integrated, it's that well received into the whole picture of the wine. Same with oak, 25% new oak. I do use new oak, it's subtle new oak. I don't want people saying, wow, that's a really good barrel that you're choosing. That Well, well then that's the wine. Uh, you're complimenting my barrel, not my farming, not my vineyard, not my fruit you're complimenting my choice of barrels. Well, great. Anybody can spend $1,200 on a barrel and buy the best wood from the best, you know, and the best cooper and the best forest. And uh, that's easy. <laughs> Putting the attention to the level of farming to show that vintage and not have the barrel kind of be part of the discussion, that's more artful to me. That oh, takes absolutely. more work to yes. do that. It's harder. Oh, um, it exponentially. It's that judicious use of oak like you described, but also stems. It's one of the hardest aspects in winemaking to me because less is more often. It, more and more you can't fix, especially right. with Pinot Noir that's so transparent that it's once so you make that mistake, you're done. Yeah. Right, right. And, and a lot of people say, oh, it just needs 10 years. Well, once again, who wants to have to wait 10 years to enjoy a wine? And does it really integrate? What if the fruit all drops away and all of the stem inclusion tannin that's kind of off-putting and austere now is what is relevant in the wine? When you're tasting it 10 years from now, you don't, you don't know what's gonna happen. It might integrate, it might not. And I've tasted wines that have both. I've tasted French Burgundies that have both. The fruit's gone and the stem inclusion is there and you're like, this is not good. <laughs> no one is going to sign up for a relationship that might be good in 10 years. Right. So why would you sign up for a wine? 
<laughs> that might work out. Yeah, we might develop a great relationship <laughs> if we hang together for 10 years. <laughs> if yeah, you didn't have fun on the first date and develop into a better <laughs> relationship over the 10 years, I'm sorry, it's probably not the best. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, let's share a turtle. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I'll drink to that for sure. Exactly. Uh, I, so my first time of meeting my wife, um, I was, you know, grew up on a ranch. I, she said, here's my phone number, um, leave me a voicemail. So I thought I was calling some service out in cyberspace or something, you know. So I called her after getting off work at John Ash and Company. I in introduced to her to take her rock climbing by a, a mutual friend. And I call her at 12.30 at night and she answers the phone. I was like, oh my God, I thought I was calling a, <laughs> an answering service. And she's like, oh, don't worry. I, she lived in San Francisco. She had just come in from a, uh, watching a show, Reverend Horton Heat uh, was the, the band she was seeing. And um, we talked on the phone from 12.30 in the morning until 6.30 in the morning. Oh. Never seen each other, never seen a picture of her. We had the most fun and wonderful conversation, developing a relationship over the telephone. And then I met her in Marin County to help her buy a pair of climbing shoes. And that was the first time I saw her. And I was like, oh my God, she's even more beautiful, you know, you in person her. as the conversation I had with her last night was what went through my mind. So, and that relationship has just continued to blossom for 20, what, 1995, so 25 years, 24 years. Oh, what a beautiful um, story. So, yeah, it's just, and that to me, my relationship with wine is the same way, and my relationships with vineyards are the same way. So you, you meet a site, um, and then you, you start digging into what the site's all about, right? You do soil samples and you start studying the weather patterns and it's not just putting temperature sensors out there, but it's, it's driving with your windows open in your vehicle from one vineyard to the other and feeling where are the cold pockets, where are the warm pockets, how is this in relationship to my vineyards out there on that ridge line out there? And when you're driving all over the area, you say, oh, I think this is the right clone for this site because this clone likes you know, to have warmer nights and cooler days and these selections like cooler nights and warmer days and this soil's a little sandier and it's going to develop these and you start developing these intuitions about what might work at those sites and then you plant the vineyard and then you start, you know, making wine from them and then you start going, okay, well, do I need to let it ripen a little more here or is it better to pick it early and you have to experiment, you have to play with it. It's like, it's like getting a new batch of modeling clay and being a sculptor. You can't, you can't treat every batch the same. It's going to work differently and it's going to turn into a different work of art. So every vintage is you're sculpting what mother nature gave you. And it's, it's just the most, incredible experience to to be able to share that with people to talk about the vintage to talk about how nature is really what is guiding our lives and um, it's one of the discussions that I have all the time in my tasting room that you know these these folks that are working so hard in New York and running important businesses and doing important things all over this country and the world and when they come here, I help them slow down to a level of the essence of how nature is more important to their lives than almost anything. And yes. they take that piece, that story, this bottle is a piece of that story that they take home and they share with their friends and they remember that nature is a part of their life. That Mother Nature created that wine. I didn't create that wine. I helped sculpt it, but Mother Nature gave me what I sculpted. And without her, I'd have nothing. So, um, so that's kind of the story of, of wine and, and life in general. Uh, food, wine, life. That's right. <laughs> so. um, and 
I would urge you, the listeners, to become a part of the story because this is a sort of business where you could come and stand with a vigneron and share a glass of wine and share life's musings um, and really have this kind of convivial exchange directly with the person that touched the vines that produced what's in a bottle. And I can think of very few things that are more pleasurable and actually more instructive because we all get caught in our worlds. And what we need is something that connects us to each other, and to ourselves. And the only warning that I can issue responsibly, it's not about drinking, it's relationship based. If you meet those wines, you will absolutely want to go steady. <laughs> you will not be able to walk away from that relationship. Oh, so practice you. care. When you go on the website or find the wines in some other way in your local retail store, and there's not many of them, I'm sure, we'll give you all that intel forthcoming. But however you encounter it, and I certainly recommend you do it directly because there's so many benefits to that relationship. As I just described, um, you will have an opportunity to have that dialogue. Mm. And that's so much value added. But however you seek those wines, you must know that it's the beginning of a beautiful relationship and it's a lifetime commitment. So, Ilana, thank you very much for coming to visit us at thank Small you. Vines. Have a great afternoon. My pleasure. And continue your wonderful work at Palette Exposure. Thanks again for tuning in to the official podcast of Palette Exposure featuring Alona Thompson. We'll see you again next week.